On Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Foundation for the Carolinas, inspiring philanthropy and empowering individuals to create a better community. And by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. Well, when I think about who I am, if you don't think, quickly the answer is, oh, I'm a 55-year-old retired pediatrician. Okay. I think the more thoughtful answer is I am a, a person of my family and my society. So I am a, a child of this family that cares much about justice, that cares much about every person, that, that what we have or don't have doesn't tell us our value, our worth, our dignity. And, I, and the other part is I live in a society in which Society much does tell you who you are is based upon your, your worth, your value, your color, your status. And that's part of me too. That's intrinsic. There are ways that impacts the way I think about people, the way I look at the world that I don't know yet. And I need to be open to learning about that. Um, but those are the two things that form who I am. And I'm more and more want to be that, that I'm the person of my family's values. Stephen Valder is a pediatrician who practiced medicine for 23 years. He was a partner at Providence Pediatrics and previously served as chair of the Department of Pediatrics at Carolina's Medical Center. Stephen retired in 2015. He has since become interested in addressing the issue of affordable housing. He is a founding board member and vice chair of the Westside Charlotte Community Land Trust. He is a provider of housing units for low-income residents, and he is an advocate for several affordable housing solutions. Stephen also serves as a board member of Teen Health Connection. In this episode, we explore retiring from the practice of medicine, contributing to community, a legacy of civil rights advocacy, and living authentically. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Welcome, Stephen. Good morning. Stephen, you are a doctor who practiced medicine for 20 years and stopped in order to pursue greater meaning and fulfillment in your life. You are focusing your work on affordable housing as a private citizen, unaffiliated, with a nonprofit organization. There's a lot to unpack. I'd like to start with your career. What kind of medicine did you practice? So I was a pediatrician here in Charlotte for 20 years in private practice. You've said that your first day was just like your last day. How so? Well, what I did, so when I showed up in 1995, you come into the office and you come in, the patient be waiting for you in a room, you go in the room, you take your history, you do your exam, you make decision-making, you finish that, you leave the room, you go to the next room. You do that again. Now, each person's different. Each connection is different. Building relationships is, has variety. But ultimately, the work of the practice is the same. Fast forward to August of 2015. You walk in the room. You take a history. You do an exam. You make decision-making. You communicate, have a relationship, and you go to the next room. And you do that 20, 25 times a day. There were other, some small changes. Um, when we started, did inpatient care. We went to the ER in the middle of the night. We took phone calls in the middle of the night. Over time, a lot of those things were taken away, which took away some of the work, but at the same time, it left what was left was more and more routine. How did you feel about the work that you were doing? There were many good things with what I did. Having that trust of the patients, the ability to be intimately involved in their lives. I'm sure there are thousands of people that think of me as, as one of the special and helpful people in their lives, which is an honor. And I knew what I did was good. At the same time, I always felt, uh, is this what I want to do forever? Is this just for now? Is there a different way to do it? There was something that still felt lacking, and yet it wasn't clear what that could be. I think with anything new, so a new job, a new location, 
there's always that transition of learning the new stuff that keeps you engaged and keeps you focused and feel like there's growth and movement. But I think then comes a point where then you're not in a rut, but the values that are maybe I want to bring to the office to change something, to impact something, whether it has to do with patients or staffing or the system of medicine, you find that you're really not able to change. And so you start to go, well, and I'm someone who wants to bring change, bring my values to bring purposeful change to the world. And then you're finding blocked in that. And I wasn't aware of this while working or maybe not till the end, but I don't remember if it's Malcolm Gladwell or kind of idea of what it takes to have job satisfaction. Generally, they say there's three things. One is being an expert, having some skill that you bring that you feel you can do very well. The other is having connection with those you work with. And I don't think it has to be, they have to be your best friends, but you like the people you're with. You're not being bullied. You're not feeling disliked. And third, having autonomy. And I think that was probably the part that I most felt was lacking. I, I had autonomy in the room with the patient. I have autonomy of how I interact with my staff, but I don't have autonomy in how do I impact a system? How do I impact decisions that a group makes that maybe don't reflect my values as well as I would like? Those things were things like, I'm like, oh, I feel like I just have to stuff myself and not, not be me completely. In your 20 year career, when was it that you began having these feelings? To some degree, even within the first few years, I can remember thinking, this is a good thing to be doing for another five years, but maybe I should do something else. At that time, the something else might have been, do I go to a community health center in inner city Chicago? Do I explore starting something here that serves a different population or in a different way? You know, so those thoughts were there, but at the same time, you know, some of the good things from what I did was that I had time to be with my family. I had an income that allowed me to contribute to my community economically, to provide for my family, to not have to worry, well, what would happen if I change? But for whatever reasons, those type of leaps were not leaps that I was comfortable enough or brave enough to make. Did you share these thoughts with your colleagues? No. (laughs) Maybe someday I'll understand all my inner motivations. I'm fairly introverted. I believe the things I believe very strongly. My values are deeply meaningful to me. There's almost that part of I put myself out enough or not enough, and I feel a little pushed back or pushed down. And my instinct is, okay, I'll just keep my treasures inside because they're not being accepted. So for good or bad, I think I push, but then when I feel threatened or vulnerable, I tend to more come into the shell. Stephen, do you think your colleagues may have felt the same way, but also kept their feelings to themselves? Absolutely. It's it's possible. It's likely. So here you are going to the office every day, and your colleagues in your practice are going to the office every day. You and perhaps others are having this private crisis, and you and your colleagues are not talking about it. And as you said, and even things I read now, the, the rate of physicians who would be considered to be burned out or burning out is 50%. I don't know, give or take, but it's, it's not a small number. Stephen, early in your career, you took time to self-assess your aptitudes. What were your aptitudes? So I think as I recognize some of my dissatisfaction or wondering if there was a different place or a different way to do my work that would be more fulfilling, I didn't want to just jump and do something different and find out it was no different or it was worse. And so I did some evaluations in which they look at aptitudes. I actually did it twice, once at Johnson O'Connor, which is a long-standing place in Atlanta that does it all by hand. I also did it here in Charlotte, which is pretty much the same but computerized. And aptitudes are different than doing an SAT or an MCAT. They're measuring things like pattern recognition and accuracy and speedily comparing two different groups of things and how do you process even things like tone and rhythm recognition. And what it came out as is I had multiple high aptitudes. And the takeaway was you're most satisfied when you're using your aptitudes well. However, it's difficult to use multiple aptitudes on any one task. And yet I have a task that is repetitive and fairly confined. And so then hard to bring in the other things that I'm missing. Main advice I 
remember, was the guy saying, be very careful about jumping to something else because the grass is not always greener because you will still find that you have aptitudes that are not used well. Sometimes the better thing is to learn to play a musical instrument. You know, how do you do it outside of? But I think medicine is consuming enough, and I have three kids and a family. We were fairly involved with church activities. There wasn't a whole lot of space to go, I'm, I'm going to develop a whole other realm that will scratch these other itches. So, so I kind of kept that, well, maybe in five years I'll be in a place that um, I can take that leap. And it just, it just never arrived. Stephen, you also explored what a life coach you retained called genuine motivations. Yeah, so that was more recently after I stopped working. And even now as I seek, what am I doing? How do I do it? As my mind thinks, well, whether it's the volunteer activities or things I pursue, what do I put myself into? Still having some of those questions. And so I met with a life coach and he asked me to share stories that are meaningful to me. And from those would kind of draw out, where's the meaning you're, he's hearing in that? And, and the main ones that I think really fit for me and helps me to think about it is following my values is probably the, the top one. Interacting through truth telling, it's hard for me not to speak the truth. And so when I feel like I'm having to be curtailed or re- restrained, that that then feels like I'm not living my values. It's kind of that conflict is, is in there. And then figure out and solving. My mind is always thinking, how could this be better? How can I interact in the situation where the outcome would not have been as it was or could have been improved or better next time? Or the equity issues in Charlotte, the housing issues in Charlotte. So that's always in the background of my head. Stephen, as you began thinking about leaving the practice of medicine, what factors were you balancing in that decision? Part of it is the patients. How does that impact them? Even just the difficulty of, of saying goodbye. There are some doctors that you find out they're leaving two weeks before they leave. And I, I announced it probably eight months prior to stopping. But I knew in those months before that, there were some folks that wouldn't be back for a year. Especially if they're a teenager, I may not see them. For me to be okay with that, I then did kind of keep track of that and at least sent a, a direct communication to them to make sure that they heard from me prior to the end. And as well, it was a, it's a great career. There's much security in being a doctor. The chances that someone is going to walk in and I wasn't going to have a job were probably as close to zero as there is in this world. I was able to provide well for my family to not worry about how do I pay for the house? Where do we go on vacation? All those type of things. You mentioned the prestige or the place in society of being a doctor. If anything, I'm a little different. I always kind of was a little embarrassed when folks would say, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I'm a doctor. I don't think I've ever been someone who goes highfalutin, but certainly there is privilege there and recognition you, that whether you use it overtly or not is there. And then some of the things that keep you from doing that is just fear. What if I do this and it's not the right choice? When I'm coming back, oh yeah, look at that guy. He thought he was ready and he wasn't. Well, yeah, what will people think? What, what does my wife think? What, what will be my purpose? Um, when I'm not doing that. And it's just difficult to make a change. I've shared with you, one of the things I most like of your podcast is as people talk about their brave decisions, the leaps they've made, um, that's always when I'm most touched hearing their stories. Stephen, you just mentioned the courage to leap, the courage to make a decision, especially life decisions based on deeply held beliefs. When did the moment come for you? There was no one moment where I think where things changed, maybe it's a little bit of the frog in the water and you're turning the heat up and you just don't know what's getting hotter. But the moment in my mind is after 15 years of practice, I might maybe am complaining some about work or, well, I don't want to do this forever, but I guess I have to do it. You know, I said to my daughter, the problem is I keep saying five more years, but the next year I say five more years. And she said, well, daddy, pick a day. And at that moment, I thought for well, five years from then, I, my youngest would finish high school because of those benefits of medical practice. I had college saved for, retirement pretty well saved for, and I would have been there 20 years and nothing magical about 20 years, but I was like, gosh, I can stop on the exact day, 20 years from when I started. Well, that's certainly not a quitter, right? Maybe that's, maybe that's one of my hesitations. Like, oh, am I a quitter? Because I've 20 years at a job is 20 years. And so at that moment, I picked a day. I ended up retiring 13 days after it because somebody was on vacation and they asked if I would stay till the vacation was over. Now, 
I knew that. My wife knew that. Not many others knew that. Stephen, do you see something wrong with the practice of medicine that doesn't allow you to be the caring person that you are? I have two thoughts to that question. First, regarding the practice of medicine, the system that we have, there's a system that's producing a result, and I'm not able to impact that system in a way to change the result that's occurring. And so what I will experience if I stay is the same frustration that I have being here. But the second thought is my internal self-critique of, is it just me? Could I not be different, interact in the system a different way, or be willing to let the good on one side make up for the struggle on the other? And even there's times I wonder, should I have five years earlier leaped to a different place to be sure that it was a system of medicine and not the specific place or my specific interactions. But so maybe I tend to not believe it was predominantly burnout, but maybe the burnout component comes that I got to the point that I wasn't willing to spend another five years to find out if a different situation would allow my values and what I was feeling that was lacking to be lived out in my life. In walking away from a medical practice mid-career, you gave up 20 more years of income and accumulated financial wealth. What was enough for you? So I had thought about this for a long time and I keep track of things so I can tell you what we spend on this category or that category. And we felt very comfortable with how we live. I probably live frugally for a physician and wealthily for everybody else. And I realized that Things that would change after retirement was I'm no longer saving for retirement. I'm no longer saving for college because I've done that. And that actually with what was left, that we could live as we live, not forever, but I think adequately, and that therefore that additional income wasn't going to change that ability. That would have changed our ability to give, our ability maybe to help our children in certain ways, but to maintain what our level of living, um, that was enough. And so then, and I'm sure it was conscious, but then the thought is, if I have enough, or even if I have an abundance, then what am I spending my life on for those next 5, 10, 15 years? Is it just to have more? Well, that doesn't get me out of bed in the morning. And at least I think I, I grew up in a family which modeled that the goal in life is not just to have more, that we're not here just for ourselves. How did your colleagues and patients respond when you told them that you were leaving? My colleagues kind of just asked, was it anything we've done? Was there some reason? And I was kind of like, well, no, no, no. I'm just, it's, you know, kind of some things we've talked about, maybe not in this depth, but certainly reassured very quickly there was no person or incident that this had been planned process. And they knew me well enough to know that I planned things. I'm the one that put in for a vacation request 10 months ahead of time. I never just came at the last minute and said, change my schedule next week. I'm going on vacation. So, so they knew me well enough for that. Interestingly enough, the partner that was, had come a year after I started, after I announced this, she actually ended up leaving before I did. She kept practicing as doing local tenums, filling in at different offices, but got to step away from that day to day demand. And then strictly for her practice, so she kept practicing, but she did make that change because it also said, wait, I don't have to just stay here. There's another option. Patients, for my patients, the most common response was, oh, you're too young to retire. And I'd kind of say, well, I'm too young to have to retire. You know, and then they'd ask, well, what are you going to do? And I had taken one class online from the graduate school at UNC in public health, and I thought about maybe pursuing that. But I kind of said, I'm, I will have vocation. Um, whether it's a paid vocation or a not paid vocation. I, I really don't care to watch TV. I tried golfing. I don't like golf. And I will do something that means something to me. Stephen, you were 52 years old when you did retire. Did you retire too young? No. And as I said, there's not any one thing. But I, I had, at least for how I am, and I had come to the point that I was really feeling like I am spending my life in an unhealthy way for me and that I had to change that. And I strongly believe that we were at a place that that would not impact my family in a negative way, but I was not so sure that continuing would not impact my family in a negative way. 
what happened after you stopped practicing medicine? I, I kind of copied something I learned when we had attended a Presbyterian church where a longtime pastor had retired or moved on. And they bring an interim person in for basically like at least a month for every year the pastor was there, not allowing a new full-time person to come in. And what I learned when I asked why they did that was, well, because people tend to either pick someone just like what they had before or somebody completely different. And then that's not a very good reason to pick somebody. So I thought in my head, I don't want to jump into something right away, whether it's a job, public health, or volunteer stuff, and then find I just pick something that does the exact same thing that I found difficult, or I just do something completely different, which is no better reason to do something. So I'm just going to participate. And so I then started attending more things, things I would like to have attended that were very hard to attend when I would have to rush someplace to be there at seven. So going to the Levine Museum and there are multiple wonderful programs they have. Participate in neighborhood association meetings, sustain Charlotte activities, going to the Tuesday morning forum that's held in the Belmont Community Center about local issues. Just anything that was of interest going, let's go and listen. Um, when someone says, oh, I think you would like this, I go, fine, let's go. Or my son would tell me, oh, I met this guy. You should have lunch with him. I'd call him and say, let's have lunch. And just said, let's find out what sticks. You became an interested citizen participating in attending events. And I got to find out there are so many things going on in this city, so many people who truly care about the citizens of the city, about the issues, about how it impacts all of us, not, not, not just those that, that need the most help, but, but all of us. These issues impact all of us. And many of us with position and privilege are impacted in ways that we don't even recognize, that our, our lives would be fuller and better if we were more connected to our community. What did you begin to discover about the city and yourself as you began attending these events? I don't know that there was particularly new discovery. You know, stay pretty aware of what's going on. And I might be one of the longest active Charlotte Observer subscribers <laughs> around, except for my parents. <laughs> but also tried to learn, well, where are the places that I can be involved in? And, and this is no surprise to anyone listening to this, but one of the most active issues in Charlotte is the issues of affordability and housing. And there could be many other issues I would say are just as important, but I'm not going to be a lobbyist going to Raleigh or, you know, some of those things. But, but that seemed to be an area that kind of stuck where some folks I met and some initiatives that were starting that I felt like I could be helpful with. The issue of affordable housing did draw your attention. Why do you think it was that issue that drew your attention as opposed to so many others in the city of Charlotte? Well, hopefully, is as I learned about different issues and as I learn about myself and what skills I do have, what passions I do have, that this is an area where I can understand it, I can work on it in the ways that I can work on it. It, it fit. Stephen, how have you gone about leaning into the affordable housing issue and contributing to solutions? A few main ways that that's at this point fleshed out. The number one is that I'm on the board. I'm actually now the vice chair of the board for the West Side Community Land Trust, which is a nonprofit organization committed to developing permanently affordable housing. So housing that does not require a subsidy to be added in over and over again, but, but applied once. Now, that's a process. It takes time. It takes to get communities together and to build resources and to build staff. And so at one point, someone made the offhand comment to me that you don't have to be a nonprofit to provide affordable housing. I said, oh, that, that's true. And so my wife and I have taken a um, substantial portion of our retirement funds, which some of which I hope I don't have to spend for 20 years, right? And have invested in some affordable housing units that are predominantly rented out to tenants with um, Charlotte Housing Authority vouchers. And really, it's the goal to see, can we preserve that capital for our later years? Maybe make a modest return that keeps up with inflation, but not have to be seeking higher returns. And and I have the, the privilege of being in a place that this isn't having to pay my mortgage or put food on my table. And so how do we use this instead of just putting it in Apple and Amazon and hoping it doubles, which again, what that's more enough. What's more enough do for you? And so we've done that. The third thing that's kind of more unorganized, but a group of individuals have met a 
three, four times to try to somewhat understand how to use accessory dwelling units. And not maybe so much directly as a direct impact on affordable housing, even though some would lean that way. But even just that in any place, you know, an affordable dwelling unit is a small unit that anyone can have in their residential property. Well, the smallest unit in any neighborhood will be the more affordable unit in that neighborhood. Whether it's affordable for everybody may not be if it's in Myers Park, but but where it is. So trying to figure out how can we do that economically enough that it's a viable option for people. And we kind of find out maybe it's hard to do it economically enough, and that's why it's not being done, but we're exploring that. And in some of those meetings I've gone to, like I've attended the Homeless Services Network meetings. I've gone to, they have an advocacy committee that meets. I've gone to that. I've connected some with the Greenspawn Center, which one of their four initiatives is on affordable housing. And have been through those organizations have been willing to use my time. And when they want to meet with city council or meet with the senator staff, I'm not so much the one that's going to come in and make the presentation. But if my voice or my being there provides evidence of the community support, then I've been participating in that. Stephen, one of the approaches that you mentioned for addressing affordable housing in Charlotte was your own ownership of affordable housing units being a landlord. What has that experience been for you? Well, like anything new, there's learning. I'm certainly glad I've done it. And I've had two full years now. And each and each year I've been in the positive. You know, so that's been good. Now, the units I purchased have been units that needed a fair bit of rehabilitation. And so, in fact, I have one unit that I've owned for more than a year that still is not occupied because it's still ongoing in its repairs. And there's been some issues of vandalism and stuff that has slowed things down. And and kind of overall with all these initiatives, I've learned that on one hand, when I was working and had some frustration with a very expert but very routine process of work, that there's frustration and working in areas that you're not an expert in, or there's learning, there's ch- challenges. And so, so I've learned a lot. So there's some things I would do differently. And at this moment, if the West Side Community Land Trust was able to acquire my properties at my purchase cost and, and manage them, I'd be more than happy for that to happen. But until there's someone who can acquire them and maintain them affordable permanently, then, then I will do that. Stephen, how many housing units do you own? So I own 12 units, four duplexes and four single family homes. And what is your approach to how you set the rent amount? Um, so I do use a property manager. For the most part, they set the rent for what, what they would say is the market for that area. Now, all my units are in areas in which the going rates are, are still modest. I actually do follow each year the area medium income. And so my rent levels would be affordable for a family that's making 50 to 60% of area medium income. But because there are 10 of the 12 units are rented out to tenants with vouchers that the, actually the tenants are at 30% and below. But I watch that and I talk to some of the people I work with and say, give me an honest reflection. Are these rents appropriate? I can't go so low that I'm in the negative every year, but I also don't want to go high to where I'm adding to displacement or not giving a choice to someone. What do you do if someone pays rent late or does not pay rent at all? So that's one of the learning episodes. I have have had one tenant evicted where they had gotten three or four months behind three different times. And actually the property manager would start the eviction process and I would talk to the tenant and kind of put it on pause. And then maybe they called up one time and then another time they had some help from a local agency. And the third time, it's just, I think it was three or four months of no rent in which I didn't stop the process that time. More recently, I've had one tenant that has struggled even just to pay his portion. Which is, and and I believe now he's he's catching up. He's gotten some help and will hopefully be able to maintain. Um, but even that, I learned that in some ways by being forbearing, being patient, that when your disability income is $960 a month and you're $150 behind, you might be able to find someone to help you catch up or catch up yourself if you get that scary notice early on, even though it does add some cost, where once you're $800 behind, there's absolutely no physical way to catch that up. And so with him, I mostly had to say is don't worry about what you're behind, but I need you to make ongoing efforts, you know, because you've made assurances and then they don't happen. And and I tell him, I, I don't know how I would do it if I was in your shoes, but I can't not have you pay your, your portion. 
I'm learning and trying to be me, but also do it in a way that I can, that is sustainable. Is there an emotional conflict for you in an effort to provide affordable housing as a landlord, but at the same time being in a position where you have to put out people who are not able to pay the rent for the places that you're renting out? Certainly the answer is yes, which would explain why I've gone against the advice of my property managers and let these two instances carry out longer than they should. A little harder now, because as they would tell me, well, you can do that, but it's just going to happen again. And and maybe even, like I mentioned, it might even be easier for the tenant to make it out of this difficulty with an earlier notice of impending eviction than a later notice. And then the other part with the work I do, I you know that systems part of my head kind of goes, well, but there's a system I can't change. I can't make up all the deficits. And so I, I certainly constantly have self-critique. And as I mentioned, and, and with both these cases, we'll have people that I know that are deeply committed to community engagement and community stability. And we'll talk to them some about here's what's going on. What do you see different that I could do or couldn't do? Generally, we'll understand that if I don't do it in a way that can be sustained, then I, at some point I'll walk away and the next person will not try as hard. A property manager asked me once, as I contemplated getting into this area, that if I were to do this, their first question to me would be, is this a business or a mission? That he could work with either one, but he would need to know which it was so he would know how to deal with issues that came up. So I think, yes, the difficulty is how do you balance those two issues? Because a business that isn't sustainable will not continue to be a business. And yet, if there's no mission to it, it's not a business I want to be a part of. And so I, I continue to try to find where that right line is, and I will make mistakes on one side or the other. But the goal is to find a balance here that respects my contributions, but also the, the tenant's needs and, and their humanity, their life issues. Stephen, what have you learned about yourself in this transition since leaving the practice of medicine? That I'm complicated. <laughs> and I maybe someday I'll understand myself and even the process of thinking through these issues to talk to you has helped in some ways to put different thoughts together. The one thing I'm most aware of is that whatever I do, there's going to be frustrations. The frustrations of the routine and the common of the repetitiveness of medicine. There's frustrations of trying to discover how do I bring my values to a complicated thing like affordable housing, to issues of poverty and how they impact individuals, not just systemic structures that nobody has clear answers to that. And I certainly don't have clear answers. And so there's trying to find what are the right decisions, right answers, right processes in a complicated, complex situation is also difficult. Stephen, you were a frustrated, caring physician. Are you a frustrated, caring citizen? The potential is there, but right now I, I I feel like I'm doing what I want to do. doesn't mean every day. I do what I want to do, but I'm doing what I want to do. I'm aware of, you know, a few things going on that I go, okay, this is something I need to kind of off board. And there's no reason why I have to keep doing something that's not providing life purpose. Are you more fulfilled now in this stage of your life than you were before? Yes. Right, right now, I, I feel like I am doing what, not, maybe not quite what I was made to do, but I am able to experiment and to step out and to put myself forward and try to bring who I am to impact the things I care about as best I can. And not that I can do it better than someone else. I can only bring what I can bring, but that I'm able to do that and largely without constraint, except my own internal constraint, that I want to treat each person with the dignity that they have, that it, I'm not the answer. I'm not here to do something for you that that isn't what you want or isn't to do it with you. If anything, I think a challenge I have is I tend to have an instinctual fear that power or privilege or, well, it certainly can be oppressive, but I think I sometimes lean to the point of it, it's always oppressive. So I'm afraid to use it. I'm afraid I will bring it in a way that isn't respectful and caring and appropriate for the situation. And so I'm trying to have more trust to myself to be brave enough to bring what I have to bring. And if 
it creates a tension somewhere than to be an adult and to try to deal with that tension and to learn and to, to receive feedback, but not be so afraid of pushback that I don't put myself out in, in the best ways that I can. Stephen, you had the economic wherewithal to leave your career to enter into this new stage of your life. What would you say to other people who similarly want to live a life closer to their values, but struggle economically with making that leap or that change in their life? And that's a great question. I wish I had a great answer. I certainly acknowledge and am aware that how blessed I've been to be able to have a job and a career in a place and a time that I've been able to, to make this transition. And it's not one that most people will be able to do, at least in the way that I did it. And, and as part of that question, even my prime hesitation, even in this interview is, I have never been and don't like to be, hey, look at me. I'm the guy up front. Let me, I'm the example. I am not an example in this. I am just living out what I care about in a way that I think is healthy for me and my family and my community as best I can. And there's no way to say that this is what I would say that this is a calling for someone else who's not in that situation. Now, if I'm an example, there are many people who have much more than I have and have the ability to impact their community and their world and not just go, can I have another zero at the end of my account next year? This may go back to your prior question of what other professionals may have thought. I always, like my wife would go, well, who are you talking to about all this? And I go, well, I, I, I read a lot and blog and I kind of know the numbers. I show you my spreadsheets and what you need to live and all this. But I go, the problem is, most doctors, if they knew my balance sheet, would go, how in the world can you retire with that at 52 years of age? And most of the rest of the world would look at my balance sheet and go, well, you're just a rich white guy. Who are you to tell us how to approach the world? And so I'm not here to tell anyone. I'm just here to go, this is how I'm trying to live my life. And I ask myself every day, is, is what I call enough really a, not an abundance and a surplus that I'm holding on to? Where does our wealth come from? And I've spent time, look at my family. My, my mother's family comes from Iowa. They're farmers. That land was not originally owned by these Norwegian farmers. It was owned by, by native people. Okay. So, so I have a privilege from that. I got to go to Mars Park High School. I went to Duke University. I got to go to Baylor College of Medicine. I send my resume out to 10 or 12 practices in North Carolina. Some of them offer me jobs before we had lunch. I come with privilege and, and a past that's been given to me by my society that I didn't earn directly by myself. I worked in a career where as a doctor, I got paid 10, 12, 15 times more an hour than the people working the front desk and, and, and pulling the files. Now, I didn't make that happen. I don't know if I could even change that, but that's a privilege that I had. And I want to live my life where at least the privilege I have is not going just for me, just for my family, but but for all my family, this community in Charlotte predominantly. And, and the issues I pick are largely issues that impact people that have been excluded from those systems that I've been so blessed to be privileged by. Steve, where did you grow up? I was born in New Orleans. As I mentioned, my parents were Midwestern farmers. And they moved after they got married to New Orleans in 1960. To She's a nurse, and he, was, he went to teach. Um, he taught at an African-American high school. Their plan was to do that for a few years and move back to the north and be teachers. And they just got immersed in the south and in the issues of civil rights and ended up living in Alabama when I was three, four years old. My dad worked for Hooper Civil Rights Organization. Then we moved to Charlotte when I was five, where he was the director of the Legal Defense Fund here in Charlotte. And then from five through high school, I lived here and grew up here in Charlotte. Stephen, your mom, your dad, and your stepdad were all active in the civil rights movement. Tell me about your dad, Bob Valder. So my father um, grew up in the Midwest, South Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, and had graduated high school, went to college, planned on being a teacher while in college, I believe in St. Louis at a national Catholic college youth mm -hmm. conference. Met some Afro-Americans. There aren't very many Afro-Americans in Iowa. 
And they said, oh, we're having a great conversation. Let's go out and have a beer and keep this up. And they're like, we can't. Like, what do you mean? Well, there's no place in St. Louis that you and I can have a beer together. And so that kind of, I think, was the first story that I ever heard of that awareness being woken. As he and my mother got married right after college, they then moved to New Orleans. And from there, he's he spent his whole life being involved with um, civil rights work. In New Orleans, he was a teacher at African-American High School, then ended up moving to Alabama, and then end up in 1968 coming to Charlotte as the director of the Legal Defense Fund, which is the legal branch of the NAACP, and was worked with that un- until his death in 1981. And your mom, Jan Balder? She's a nurse, worked in Head Start programs here in Charlotte, was mostly a homemaker, um, even though she did have times where she worked some of hospice. She worked at Good Samaritan Hospital prior to it being replaced by the Panthers Stadium. She was a burr in the side of whoever the chairman of the hospital authority was as they made that decision. And then she's been deeply involved with things, whether it's the Mercy Foundation or Arts and Science Council. Going back to Bob Valder, he worked very closely with Chamber Stein Ferguson, the first integrated um, African-American law firm in the South. So all those heroes I knew growing up, <laughs> babysat many of their kids, went to the beach with their families. And Stephen, you have a stepdad, your mom remarried. Barney Offerman. Barney Offerman had known my parents when they were in New Orleans. Every time I see him, he'll tell me about me toddling around and him loving that energy and exuberance. And then I'm not sure how well they say connected, but reconnected a few years after my father died. And then in 1985, he married my mother for his first marriage at age 55. And and they've now been married for 33 years. And Barney has been active in civil rights as well. I don't know his stories as well, but when he moved to Charlotte, he actually taught at J.C. Smith for a few years before he retired. Um, he had been a professor in Ohio, um, had worked some with the Celeste when he was a governor. So I think different things. I believe his, he was a Ph.D., and I think it was more on unions and worker economic issues. How did the example of your parents influence you? Well, when I think about who I am, If you don't think, quickly the answer is, oh, I'm a 55-year-old retired pediatrician. Okay, I think the more thoughtful answer is I am a a person of my family and my society. So I am a a child of this family that cares much about justice, that cares much about every person, that, that what we have or don't have doesn't tell us our value, our worth, our dignity. And the other part is I live in a society in which Society much does tell you who you are is based upon your your worth, your value, your color, your status. And that's part of me too. That's intrinsic. There are ways that impacts the way I think about people, the way I look at the world that I don't know yet. And I need to be open to learning about that. Um, but those are the two things that form who I am. And I more and more want to be that, that I am the person of my family's values and of my values, not of the society's values that are not, that are not appropriate. Stephen, you attended Myers Park High School and you went on to Duke University as an undergraduate. What do you remember about attending Duke University? Unfortunately, I was there during the early years of Mike Krzyzewski. Of course, it was a lot easier to get into a game than than it is now. There was no Shoseskiville, no camping out. I was very involved when I was there with a a Christian fellowship. And so had deep friendships from that that I think are still there. One of the downsides of Duke is people from all over. And so now they are all over. And I preceded all this internet email stuff. And so you you didn't have a way to really keep up with people much in those those first years. And so even though the folks that I kind of know what they are, what they're doing and where they are. I haven't really kept deep relationships with folks from there that are routinely part of my life, except for one. That one person is someone you did meet at Duke. Who is she? So certainly the one person that I met that has been most intimately involved in my life is is my wife, Odette Valder. She was a year behind me, and I met her fairly early in that I was um, in, the, in the Christian fellowship, was leading a Bible study, a weekly gathering, 
in the dormitory she was in. And one of the RAs who was a friend of mine met her the first day. Thing is, she's from Puerto Rico, brilliant um, and beautiful. But language is, you know, was still harder for her, even though she had done high school in English. And, and so she often didn't come to our gatherings because she was writing her paper and stuff. So I would go by afterwards and visit, you know, talk to her. And so, and so we became friends. And at least at that time when I was at Duke, Duke wasn't a place with, with a lot of dating, at least not in the kind of the Christian groups. A lot of friendships. You could go to any cafeteria together. You didn't have to go off campus. I hardly ever went off. And so we, by the time I graduated, we, we were best friends. And maybe we'd gone to a formal or something, but never, never anything that was a coupling. The following year, when she was a senior, she was traveling the country interviewing for medical schools. And I was um, living north of Boston, attending a graduate school in theology part-time and working in a, as a lab technician at a chemical plant to pay my rent. And after she left from the weekend there interviewing at Tufts and Harvard, one of my roommates said, why aren't you dating her? And it's like, ah, I don't know. And so I called her. I went to Duke to visit, scared her to death because she knew me well enough to know this was not some lighthearted contraption. And we started dating long distance. She went off to school at Baylor College of Medicine, and you followed. Yeah, so she so instead of Boston to Durham, we were Boston to Houston. Fortunately, that was when People's Express existed, so we made frequent use of that. And I started to realize that if I kept doing what I was doing part-time, first off, it, it would take forever. And ultimately, I was either going to have to go on to a PhD or I was going to go into work, church work. And even though I had interest in those issues, I did not feel called to be a minister or full-time church worker. And so felt like just because maybe I could do it if I kept pushing that way, that that wasn't the right reason. The second part, and maybe it's really just more that Odette was in Houston, she told me about the people she met in medical school. And she met people from all backgrounds. And people that were really doing things, that started clinics, were doing things and weren't just being in medicine because what they got out of it. And not that's what was going on at Duke, but my impression at Duke was you became a doctor because that's what you did to be well off. And I was like, well, if that's why you become a doctor, then that's not what I'm doing. And so partly going, well, what am I going to do? Um, I ended up applying to medical school and the story could be longer, but ended up being able to go to Baylor College of Medicine as well. So I went from being a year ahead of her in college to two years behind her in medical school. You earned your degree in medicine at Baylor College, and then you did your residency in pediatrics. Why pediatrics? When I hear that question, it, it fits that theme, that struggle I have of being the expert in the more confined box or being a non-expert in a bigger but more variable box. I went to medical school thinking I'd do family practice. But every time I did no rotation, I remember doing cardiology and you're, someone's getting a cath for the third time, the catheterization of their heart for the third time in 18 months. Because when they come in with chest pain, just because their last one was good doesn't mean that this one's good. And you kind of saw that with adults, what you're doing, you're managing illness. And then in addition with family practices, you know, one patient's a heart attack and the next one's a someone pregnancy, the next one's a child. Gosh, that seems like, how can I know all that stuff? Where pediatrics was much more developing, the managing growth, development, vaccines, you know, work, working with families. So I think there, I found some comfort in being a little more specialized. And then the other factor came in is since we were not in the same level of that when she had to go to residency for her to leave Houston, then either we're apart or I leave. Well, that's, there's no way to tie yourself together. It'd be two independent applications. So she stayed, but Baylor's a big medical school and great programs. And then when it's time for me to go, the pediatric program there is, is, is top nationally, you know, one of the top five or whatever. So to do something else would also maybe jeopardize that. So, and it was also a place I could talk to the chairman. He goes, Oh, if you apply, you have a spot. You don't have to worry. The answer is yes, but it's mostly, I think it fit. My wanting to be an expert, not wanting to have that every encounter I don't know what I'm doing. But then at the end, 
I was frustrated by that narrow box. If you had to do a residency all over again and could choose a different field in medicine, would you make a different choice? I've thought about that. Some ways I think surgery would match me better in terms of that ability to use different talents, different ways. You have procedures, you have office practice stuff, but I like my sleep and I don't know if I could do anything where I had to be at the hospital at 5.30 every morning. Within pediatrics, I do wonder if I'd done like an ambulatory fellowship where then you stayed within academics and had teaching, research, patient care. Would a matrix like that have provided more outlets where you weren't trying to make all your desires be met in one box? But those things I've wondered about, you don't get to do that, yeah. that I know of. Stephen, sometime 30 years from now, when you look back on this stage of your life, what do you want it to have been about? So what I, what I would want when I look back is the question is, was I authentic? Was I true to myself? Was I, was I true to what I care about? Um, you know, and did I live that out? Thank you for your time today, Stephen. Thank you, Mark. I've enjoyed this time and I enjoyed your podcast. I look forward to learning about myself. <laughs>Stephen Balder is a retired pediatrician. Stephen earned a bachelor's degree in biology from Duke University and his MD from Baylor College of Medicine. And now, a personal word. One way to think about Stephen Balder is how he thinks of himself, as someone figuring out his life in middle age. Stephen is taking the time to explore himself and his community. He is seeking to develop a life authentic to his values, which are deeply rooted in his family's history, while recognizing the privilege and responsibility inherent in that life. Another way to think about Stephen is to think of the blues. Not the blues of Robert Johnson and Muddy Waters, but the literary blues of Leo Tolstoy. Tolstoy was the great Russian novelist who famously wrote War and Peace and Anna Karenina, regarded by many readers around the world as the finest realist fiction ever written. Tolstoy was born into nobility and wealth. As a young man, he led a life of leisure, studying the law but finding no joy in it. He began to write. First memoirs about his childhood. He gambled his money, ran up debts, and joined the army. His view of the world and his place in it changed after witnessing death and misery in the Crimean War. He wrote sketches from the Crimean Front. He traveled to Europe and developed a friendship with the French anarchist Pierre Joseph Proudhon and with Victor Hugo, who was writing Les Miserables at the time. Tolstoy returned to Russia and wrote his epic works on Russian society that brought him worldwide recognition. He was 40 years old when War and Peace was published. He was 48 when Anna Karenina further cemented his legacy for the ages. At the height of his fame, Tolstoy experienced a deep crisis of meaning. When he turned 50 years old, he went into deep depression. He asked, very well, you will be more famous than Gogol or Pushkin or Shakespeare or Moliere or than all the writers in the world. And what of it? celebrity and his novels suddenly meant nothing to him. He had money, good health, a wife and family devoted to him, and the admiration of the world, all of which made him feel worse for not being happier for what he had. He knew all of it would disappear, all of it would end in death. On the brink of suicide, Tolstoy gathered what strength he had and confronted his melancholia and existence in a work he entitled a confession. He wrote, My question was the simplest of questions, lying in the soul of every man from the foolish child to the wisest elder. 
It was a question without an answer to which one cannot live. As I had found by experience, it was, what will come of what I am doing today or shall do tomorrow? What will come of my whole life? Differently expressed, the question is, why should I live? Why wish for anything or do anything? It can also be expressed thus, is there any meaning in my life that the inevitable death awaiting me does not destroy? In a near manic tour de force of inquiry, Tolstoy sought a resolution to living. Albert Camus would later say that the only true serious philosophical question one must ask is whether or not to commit suicide. The answer for Tolstoy was not in science or philosophy, or in ignorance or in pleasure, or in cynicism or resignation. His answer ultimately was in faith, the irrational offering him the only rational approach to reconciling the finite and infinite. Tolstoy would go on to write The Death of Ivan Illich, What is to be Done, and Resurrection. He became an anarchist Christian pacifist, writing works on resistance and nonviolence that would inspire artists, spiritual seekers, and political revolutionaries. He rejected wealth and privilege. Near the end of his life, he became a wandering ascetic, wearing peasant clothes, dying in a train station at the age of 82 as he sought freedom on the road. I have never felt despair. I have never questioned the value of my life. I live confidently every day, but I have my moods. I wonder what it would be like to produce more notable work. I wonder what if I lived more boldly. I wish I was better on my feet in front of a crowd. I wish I could stir an audience to action on the issues of the day. In darker moments, I wonder how and when I will die and who will care. I wonder how friends will receive the news of my passing and how quickly I will be forgotten. I wonder what will become of my photo albums, of my mementos of a life lived, of the letters and cards I have bound from friends and family from years gone by. I wonder what is the point of anything. Then I joke with my wife. I pull myself together. I get on with my responsibilities. I read. I write these words. In midlife, we confront the loss of youth, an endless series of tasks that don't seem to matter very much, the narrowing of what has become of our lives, the irreversibility of time, no longer recognizing ourselves in the mirror, the decline of skills and talents, and the death of friends and family. People can feel the weight of it all. Rash decisions are made. But on the other end of midlife, something happens. We transition to something better. There is more reason to hope. There is more reason for gratitude. Life satisfaction soars. One reason why is that we live into our values. We honor friends. We pursue our interests. We cherish moments. We live and let live. Stephen Valder is asking questions. Leo Tolstoy sought answers before him. The Blues Redeem. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Additional support for this podcast is provided by the UNC College of Arts and Architecture, celebrating a decade of creative education in the arts and design. Thank you to our funding partners and to my teammates, Andy Goh, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value at a level you choose. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.